this afternoon to enjoy Matthew Wellborn's thesis presentation. Um, on behalf of the Honours Program, the Honours Committee at OBU, I just want to welcome you here. This is the, the second last, the eighth out of nine thesis presentations this spring. And for Matt, this is the culmination of what about an 18 month long process of uh, conceiving and starting and researching and writing and tweaking and revising and editing some more and been through a long process of himself and other people looking at it and uh, working on it. So this is the fruits of his labor over junior and senior year and I'm looking forward to a wonderful presentation, Seeking Shalom Through Mathematics, uh, looking at developing a Christian ethical code, discipleship code, um, and applying it to the discipline of mathematics. So please join me in welcoming Matt Wilborn. First, I think I'm going to thank a couple people that were involved in this project, uh, Dr. Tucker, uh, Professor McCollum, and Dr. Arbo were all uh, advisors to some degree at some point during this pre uh, project. So I'd like to thank them and thank you all for coming. I'm going to start off with a little excerpt from Arthur Holmes, uh, the idea of a Christian college because that's what you know, started my OBU career. And I've read it a couple times, as you can see. <coughs> so in terms of the purpose of education, Arthur Holmes uh, provides three purposes. And the first is to glorify God. Uh, the second is to pursue knowledge and common grace. And number three is because God's kingdom of shalom is already among us and yet to come in its fullness, Education will concern itself with matters of justice, peace, and love in this world, so as to help produce responsible agents rather than mere spectators on the events and social evils of our times. So let's look at the uh, more specific context of my project. I am studying mathematics, anthropology, and biblical studies here at OBU, and Mathematics is the first major I declared, but I swapped it to a minor, uh, but I still love it. And anthropology is what I will graduate with as my degree. And anthropology, for those who don't know, in its most terse definition would just be the study of cultures and people. And biblical studies is studying the Bible, so I get to take awesome classes with Dr. Kelly. And at OBU, um, many of my classes I've looked at and participated in the integration of faith and learning, which is part of the mission statement of Oklahoma Baptist University. And so this project really um, is an example and was a means by which I got to act out the mission statement of OBU. Part of the honors program is an honors thesis. We have several capstones uh, that we must complete before we graduate with honors. And one of the capstones is an honors thesis, which is a long-term research paper and presentation uh, that we have here today. So the early stages of my honors thesis, I was looking at some sort of integration <coughs> of mathematics and anthropology. So I attended a Mathematical Association of America meeting last year, and I attended a lot of the talks and participated in a lot of the discussions, and it was super fun. Um, but something that I notice as utilizing a tool of anthropology, which is participant observation, in which you go into a culture, you participate in that culture to whatever degree that you possibly can as um, whatever type of person you are, and you observe the culture and you ask questions uh, about maybe you're studying kinship, and you, so you ask a lot of questions about kinship and you make observations about kinship, and maybe the language is, the, how the language names certain people and whether names can be used by some people or not. So using a tool of anthropology, I was more or less studying uh, mathematicians at this MA conference. And as I was doing this, I noticed that there was a notable absence of discussions related to ethics and morality and the good and what can result from using the mathematics that all of the speakers were talking about during the conference. And I thought, okay, maybe that's something that's 
just, well, it's a regional meeting. It was at the University of Tulsa. Maybe it was just a regional meeting and they don't really talk about a lot of those kind of things. But then I went on the MAA website, and I'll talk about this more later, but I went on the MAA website and found out that it wasn't just the meetings, but also kind of a symptom of a larger problem that I saw. But I did work on my thesis, and over the course of working on my thesis, I got it to the point where I could actually present it at this year's MAA meeting, which was, in, was at the University of Central Arkansas. And I got to present a 15 minute version of this presentation to mathematicians of a bunch of different faiths and ages and experiences. And it was a packed classroom, which was very promising because you know, even though I didn't see or hear any ethical or many ethical considerations at the last meeting, when I gave this talk, a lot of people were interested, so it showed me a lot of promise and that people are either having these conversations already and I wasn't privy to them, or that they're interested in continuing in these types of conversations. Then I also presented to the math club uh, here at OBU, which was really cool because I got to present this in front of peers uh, mathematicians and future mathematicians and future future math teachers um, and math professors currently at OBU. So it was a nice application and integration of faith and learning. So just a continuation of uh, the whole project. And it gave me practice. So the purpose of the project uh, basically <coughs> is to promote further discussions of ethics among mathematicians. So I hope that if you know a mathematician or someone that's doing math, or even when you're doing math yourself, that you'll think, okay, well, maybe, what are the, some of the implications? Or maybe I could ask a question about something, or maybe you're interacting with, uh, say you're online and you're interacting with statistics or polling or any sort of numerical analysis or statistical analysis that you kind of pay attention to maybe some of the um, ethics or morality associated with all of the mathematics. So observations of ethical codes. Uh, Reuben Hirsch at the University of New Mexico, he uh, kind of observed, like I did back in the 80s, that mathematicians didn't really have that much of an <coughs> ethical code, and it wasn't very robust. And so that was, I guess, reassuring to some degree, but it was in the 80s, so I thought, okay, well, maybe a lot of has been done, but not so much. Uh, he did influence the American Mathematical Society to pr uh, provide and create a code of ethics, which has been updated since then. But he still saw that their code that they created was lacking in several ways and in instances. So I looked at some other codes as well. Uh, the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, which seems to be an uh, organization that would be really concerned with the application of mathematics, and they don't have a code of ethics at all. The Mathematical Association of America, that's the group that I went to the regional <coughs> with, and they do have 20, 2005 and 2015, they do have an updated code of ethics, but it's just a paragraph, and it says, in short, to be ethical. <laughs> So the American Mathematical Society, that's who Reuben Hirsch most influenced. In 1995, uh, he wrote a paper about the notable absence of a code of ethics, and they updated it in 2005. Um, there wasn't a lot of changes, but they just kind of renegotiated some of their procedures and policies. But even their code of ethics is really mostly focused with publications and being ethical professionally in the academic world. And lastly, the American Statistical Association. So I wanted to look at a code of ethics that was slightly different and perhaps was more applied to a specific portion of mathematics. And so I looked at the ASA's code of ethics in 1999. And it's actually rather sizable. Um, there are some, I would say there are some issues that weren't addressed in the ASA's code of ethics, but it was impressive for an organization to have such a robust code, and it, it kind of can serve, I think, as perhaps one example of how a code could be developed more thoroughly, although it does say that it lacks in a few ways um, 
the code itself in the intro does say that. And so I think even the ASA is open to further discussions and increasing the robustness of the code. So we have uh, a Christian ethic. And so part of my project was to propose some sort of, I guess, answer to this question of you know, what, what should a code of ethics look like for mathematicians. And I wanted to provide a Christian ethic as something that could be extended and valued by people who aren't Christians as well, because I think that while the Christian narrative is true, that's what I believe, that other people, even if they don't believe it, they can find value in it just as much as we can find certain elements of truth in other faiths and other backgrounds. And so I think that the Christian ethic is one of the many voices that can be at the table and can contribute to the discussion of ethics and mathematics, which is something that I did at the MAA meeting, so that was fun. Now, the Christian narrative itself is something that is vital to the development of a Christian ethic. Uh, you can't have Christianity or a Christian ethic without Christ, and the story of Christ is vital to understanding what that means. So we have creation. Creation, in the beginning, God created all things. He created um, everything on the sea. He made beauty and goodness, and everything was perfect, and everything was very good. Then, the fall of humankind. So Adam and Eve, who were created in the Garden of Eden, they fell prey to temptation, and this separated us, humankind, from God. And of the relationship and the fullness of that relationship with God. But God immediately promised to Adam and Eve and throughout the whole Old Testament that someone would come, that something would come that would conquer uh, conquer death and conquer pain and co conquer corruption and conquer all that which has corrupted creation and separated humankind from God and creation from its fullness of being. So that promise was fulfilled in the life, desert, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus lived, and we have this recorded in the Gospels, uh, how he lived, and it was a way in which to come to know what it is like to be human and to empathize with us, but also to serve as our substitution for our deaths, which is the requirement for our fall, so our separation from God. And so that is why Jesus died, but then he was also resurrected. And so that was a symbol, well, it was more than a symbol. It was an actuality of the overcoming of God over death, over corruption, over evil, over pain that the fall had brought into creation. And from this, we have a call to believe as human beings. We have a call to believe in this story we have a call to believe in Jesus and to participate in the redemption of creation. And so we are to participate in the resurrection. We are to participate in making things new again, to making things whole again, to writing relationships, to writing our relationships with other humans and with creation, uh, with each other, as God has righted our relationship with God's self. And the specific application of this narrative is something that James Davison Hunter of the University of Virginia, he developed, as, and he calls it faithful presence. And faithful presence is based on Jesus as God with us, so God Emmanuel, God with us, and it's <coughs> uh, also the incarnation. So faithful presence consists of three different features. We have faithful presence to each other, and this is the attentiveness and uh, the attentive, intent, attentiveness and being aware and being intentional to each other. And that could be for, this is also related to mathematics. Um, some are more specific to mathematics and some are more general. But boss and employee, scholar to scholar, so mathematician to mathematician, and professor to students, so math professor, any kind of professor, but in this case it would be a math professor and a math student. Or non-math student, but a math student in math class. Or a regular student in math class. 
We also have allegiances and loyalties, and so that is uh, looking at a code of ethics that brings up and brings to the attention of those who follow it or are trying to abide by it that we are all loyal to something or someone. And so it just is important that we have something that promotes reflexivity over who you are loyal to, uh, whether that's your employer or your faith or your family. Uh, these are all different allegiances and loyalties we have as human beings. And so it's important to think about these things and think about how they affect our work. <coughs> we also have to each other in relation to quantification. And so that's when we take uh, human beings and we number them and we put numbers to them. And this can be uh, very helpful in produ producing public policy um, and making other kind of decisions. And I mean, we make enrollment decisions based on numbers, but it also is something that could perhaps be dehumanizing and also um, lead way to perhaps some sort of cost benefit analysis where people are well, it's only 10% of the population that suffers, and so that's okay. But I mean, those 10% of the population are people, human beings that we need to be faithfully attentive and present to. Then we have effects on local, global, present, and future context. And this is something that's more, or not, uh, I guess it's more vague in the sense that we don't really know what our work is necessarily going to do in the future, but we have a lot of good ideas about the effects of our work and also our local and global context. So we live in an ever increasingly globalized world and we also live in local, uh, local groups of people. So if you're in the academic community or your Shawnee community, for instance, any kind of community that you find yourself in, that's the local effects of your work. If you're, in, if you're working for an organization, that's another example. And global, well, we have we have a lot of policies, say you work for the UN, um, so their statistics is like very important because they're affecting <coughs> the world at large. And present, well, that, that would just be global and local right now. The second aspect of faithful presence is with our tasks. So that's doing things with uh, excellence and honesty and integrity. And of Faithful presence, I would say this is the one that is most touched upon in code of ethics that we already do have. People are generally, you know, supportive of being uh, honest with their work and not cheating people out of their own work and not plagiarizing and making sure that what they're doing is honest and, and is with integrity. And faithful presence, the last one is within our spheres of influence. So to look at some of those, we have our culture, so we are culture, we are cultural beings, we participate in culture, and we have culture, <coughs> we are enculturated, and we also make culture, and those who are, say, mathematicians, are influential in culture because we do trust science and we do trust mathematics post-enlightenment significantly, so much so that we have um, entire societies and how we do public policy based on um, what the numbers tell us to do. And so it's very important as Christians and as people, uh, as intellectuals, ac academics, to do things that are um, right and proper and are redemptive. We also have, in the uh, academia, we have academic communities. Uh, this is, you know, this is where the codes of ethics currently, this is where they would kind of go under right now because, you know, people do need to respect other people's work and then also participate and help with other people, but also your work goes beyond just your mathematics work, but as people participating in, say, a research university or uh, a, whether you're teaching or doing research, you do influence more than just what your math is doing. You influence it as a person and as an uh, academic. Then also in government, we have many mathematicians in government, especially regarding statistics. and. Like I keep saying, public policy is something that uh, is very dependent on numerical and statistical analysis. And this is also related back to uh, quantification of human beings, and so they're both intricately related. And we have incorporations, so a lot of mathemat mathematicians will work within a corporation, 
uh, will perhaps lead a corporation or help a corporation make decisions. And now we have financial decisions as well. Um, and this would bleed over into business um, and people doing mathematics for business related activities and for promotion of their corporations and how they handle situations and how they do HR and how they do PR and how they run their corporation financially as well. And lastly, the church. So those who are <coughs> mathematicians and Christians have a role to play as mathematicians and as academics and as brothers and sisters in the church, the local church body and the global church body. And so if you have uh, abilities and ways to serve the church, then I believe that um, God has provided us those gifts so that we can serve the church, so we can serve the local body. And you know, maybe that's doing some accounting for the church if they need it. It could be something small like that, or it could be something as much as leading some sort of program that needs a lot of analysis relating to neighborhoods, and maybe you're doing maybe a lot of busing and coordinating, and you have to think about perhaps a poverty line and other financial issues and circumstances. And so it's all very important and related to math in a lot of interesting ways. And so it's important for the Christian mathematician to also be attentive in their local congregation. <coughs> so some examples, I've mentioned a few of these. We have polling. Polling is something that's extremely significant in both our public perception of what's going on and also how politicians relate to us and how politicians make decisions and even what politicians say. Uh, informatics, which lead again to public policy. Uh, artificial intelligence is also something that is uh, very vital for mathematicians and Christians to be involved in um, thoughtfully so that we stay aware and perhaps try to stay ahead of the curve in terms of artificial intelligence because public policy doesn't really keep up with that kind of stuff. So we, we need to make sure that culture makers, um, academics, and Christians in those contexts are, are promoting ethical discussions related to artificial intelligence. And entertainment. Entertainment is also something that's kind of, oh, well, what does math and Christianity and ethical codes have to do with uh, entertainment? Well, something that's really interesting is Pixar movies, like Finding Nemo, are based on uh, vectors, and so all of the math that goes into it is very important and uh, vital to making these movies, but also as people who make these movies, you have to think what kind of cultural values are you perpetuating? What kind of um, values are you teaching kids? And this is the next generation of people and mathematicians are affecting this. And so, if, you know, if a movie is perhaps promoting values that uh, you don't think are values that need to be promoted, then, you know, even though you're just doing vector graphics, it's still important to be involved in those discussions and be thoughtful regarding those uh, different decisions that, say, Pixar is making. And the conclusion. So we have, uh, my hope is that the application of faithful presence is something that Christians uh, and mathematicians <coughs> at large uh, at least consider and hopefully practice. Uh, I hope that other mathematicians add more perspectives of different faiths and backgrounds and ethnicities to the conversation. I hope that uh, organizations like the MA improve their ethical code so it's not just a paragraph where they at least um, provide something more akin to perhaps the ASA's code of ethics or even something greater than that. And I also hope that just in general that mathematicians and Christians and anyone who listens to this talk or reads this paper uh, feels more thoughtful about what they do as human beings and as Christians and also that we will participate in conversations uh, regarding ethics and regarding Christian discipleship and what it means to follow Jesus. I hope that those kind of conversations um, are integrated into what we're learning at OBU and also what we're doing in our churches and in our culture at large and also in whatever you know work situation we find ourselves in. So I'd like to end this thing with a prayer.
by St. Francis. And this is ties it back to seeking shalom and seeking peace. This is called the Peace Prayer by uh, St. Francis. <coughs> he said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, the truth. Where there is doubt, the faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life.